Good evening and welcome to evening prayer for Thursday, June 11th, on this the uh, Feast of St. Barnabas Apostle. Let's begin. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let my prayer rise before you as incense. The lifting up of my hands is the evening sacrifice. Joyous light of glory of the immortal Father, heavenly, holy, blessed Jesus Christ, we have come to the setting of the sun and we look to the evening light. We sing to God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You are worthy of being praised with pure voices forever. O Son of God, O giver of life, the universe proclaims your glory. The Lord Almighty grant us a quiet night and peace at the last. Amen. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praise to your name, O Most High, to herald your love in the morning, your truth at the close of the day. Praise to you, O Christ. O come, let us worship him. Lord Jesus, stay with us for the evening is at hand and the day is past. Be our constant companion on the way. Kindle our hearts and awaken hope among us that we may recognize you as you are revealed in the scriptures and in the breaking of the bread. Grant this for your name's sake. Amen. What man is there who desires life and loves many days that he may see good? Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Turn away from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous, and his ears toward their cry. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil, to cut off the memory of them from the earth. When the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears, and delivers them out of all their troubles. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted, and saves the crushed in spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. He keeps all his bones, not one of them is broken. Affliction will slay the wicked, and those who hate the righteous will be condemned. The Lord redeems the life of his servants. None of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. Our New Testament reading tonight is from John chapter 13, beginning in verse 21. After saying these things, Jesus was troubled in his spirit and testified, Truly, truly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. The disciples looked at one another, uncertain of whom he spoke. One of his disciples, whom Jesus loved, was reclining at table close to Jesus. So Simon Peter motioned to him to ask Jesus of whom he was speaking. So that disciple, leaning back against Jesus, said to him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, It is he to whom I will give this morsel of bread when I have dipped it. So when he had dipped the morsel, he gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. Then after he had taken the morsel, Satan entered into him. Jesus said to him, What you are going to do, do quickly. Now no one at the table knew why he had said this to him. Some thought that, because Judas had the money bag, Jesus was telling him, Buy what we need for the feast, or that he should give something to the poor. So after receiving the morsel of bread, he immediately went out, and it was night. When he had gone out, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself, and glorify him at once. Little children, yet a little while I am with you. You will seek me, and just as I said to the Jews, so now I also say to you, Where I am going, you cannot come. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this all people will know that you are my, di my disciples, if you have love for one another. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered him, Where I am going you cannot follow me now, but you will follow me afterward. Jesus, uh, Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Jesus answered, Will you lay down your life for me? Truly, truly, I say to you, the rooster will not crow till you have denied me three times. Our Book of Concord reading is from Part 4 of the Large Catechism on Baptism. Uh, we'll be in baptism for, I'm going to say, at least four days, maybe five, but at least four days. It's, it's quite long. Part 4, Baptism. We have now finished the three chief parts of common Christian doctrine. Besides these, we have yet to speak of our two sacraments instituted by Christ. 
Every Christian also ought to have at least an ordinary brief instruction about the sacraments, because without them he cannot be a Christian. Unfortunately, up to now, no instruction about them has been given. But in the first place, we take up baptism, by which we are first received into the Christian church. However, in order that baptism may be easily understood, we will present it in an orderly manner. We present only what is necessary for us to know. We will leave to the learned the topic of how baptism is to be maintained and defended against heretics and sects. In the first place, we must, above all things, know well the words on which baptism is founded. Everything refers to these words that must be said on the subject. The Lord Christ says in Matthew 28, 19, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Likewise, in St. Mark 16, 16, Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. In the first place, you must note in these words that here stand God's commandment and institution. Let us not doubt that baptism is divine. It is not made up or invented by people. For as surely as I can say, no one has spun the Ten Commandments, the Creed and the Lord's Prayer out of his head. They are revealed and given by God himself. So also I can boast that baptism is no human plaything but is instituted by God himself. Furthermore, baptism is most solemnly and strictly commanded, so that we must be baptized or we cannot be saved. I note this lest anyone regard baptism as a silly matter, like putting on a new red coat. For it is of the greatest importance that we value baptism as excellent, glorious, and exalted. We contend and fight for baptism chiefly because the world is now so full of sects, arguing that baptism is an outward thing, and that outward things are of no benefit. But let baptism be a thoroughly outward thing. Here stand God's word and command, which institute, establish, and confirm baptism. What God institutes and commands cannot be an empty thing. It must be a most precious thing, even though it looked like it had less value than a straw. Up to now, people could consider something great when the Pope, with his letters and bulls, gave away indulgences and confirmed altars and churches solely because of the letters and seals. So we ought to value baptism much more highly and more precious because God has commanded it. Besides, it is done in his name, for these are the words, go baptize. However, do not baptize in your name, but in God's name. To be baptized in God's name is to be baptized not by men, but by God himself. Therefore, although it is performed by human hands, it is still truly God's own work. From this fact, everyone may readily conclude that baptism is a far higher work than any work performed by a man or a saint. For what work can we do that is greater than God's work? But here the devil is busy to fool us with false appearances and lead us away from God's work to our own works. For there is a much more splendid show when a Christian, a Carthusian, does many great and difficult works. We all think much more of the things that we do and merit ourselves. But the scriptures teach this, even though we collect in one pile the works of all the monks, however splendidly they may shine, they would not be as noble and good as if God could pick up a single straw. Why? Because the person is nobler and better. Here then, we must not judge the person according to the works, but the works according to the person, from whom they must get their nobility. But our insane reason would not consider this, because baptism does not shine like the works that we do. It is valued as nothing. From this, now learn a proper understanding of the subject and how to answer the question of what baptism is. It is not mere ordinary water, but water comprehended in God's word and command and sanctified by them. So it is nothing other than a divine water. Not that the water in itself is nobler than other water, but that God's word and command are added to it. It is pure wickedness and blasphemy of the devil when our new spirits mock baptism, leaving God's word and institution out of it. They look at baptism in no other way than as water that is taken from the well. Then they blather and say, how does a handful of water help the soul? Yes, my friend, who does not know that water is water, if tearing things apart is what we are after, but how dare you interfere with God's order? How dare you tear away the most precious treasure with which God has connected and enclosed baptism, that he will not allow it to be separated. For the kernel in the water is God's word or command in God's name. His name is a treasure greater and nobler than heaven and earth. Understand the difference, then. Baptism is quite a different thing from all other water, 
This is not because of its natural quality, but because something more noble is added here. God himself stakes his honor, his power, and his might on it. Therefore, baptism is not only natural water, but a divine, heavenly, holy, and blessed water, and whatever other terms we can find to praise it. This is all because of the word, which is a heavenly, holy word, which no one can praise enough. For it has and is able to do all that God is and can do. In this way, it also gets its essence as a sacrament, as St. Augustine also taught. When the word is joined to the element or natural substance, it becomes a sacrament. That is, a holy and divine matter and sign. We always teach that the sacraments and all outward things that God ordains and institutes should not be considered according to the coarse outward mask, the way we look at a nutshell. But we respect them because God's word is included in them. For we also speak of the parental estate and of civil government in this way. If we intend only to recognize that they have noses, eyes, skin, and hair, flesh, and bones, they look like Turks and heathen. Someone might start up and say, why should I value them more than others? Because this commandment is added, honor your father and your mother. I see a different person adorned and clothed with God's majesty and glory. The commandment, I say, is the gold chain about the neck. Yes, that is the crown upon his head, which shows me how and why one must honor this flesh and blood. So, and even much more, you must honor baptism and consider it glorious because of the word. For God himself has honored it both by words and deeds. Furthermore, he confirmed it with miracles from heaven. Do you think it was a joke that when Christ was baptized, the heavens were open and the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit descended visibly and everything was divine glory and majesty? And we'll stop there. And we join in the Apostles' Creed in the Lord's Prayer. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. O Lord Jesus Christ, true King of heaven and earth, you promised to your church that the gates of hell would not prevail against her, and you still cause your word to be preached and your holy sacraments to be administered among us. But ah, O Lord, the sins of your people obscure the majesty of your bride. Your holy vineyard is trampled and your blessed sacrifice stands neglected. Many think themselves strong and despise the life-giving food that you have ordained for your people for the forgiveness of their sins. Pardon all our arrogance, and do not come to us in wrath to remove the lamp of your word from before our eyes. O Lord, we pray you, visit this vine, which you once established for yourself, and renew us with the sun of your mercy and the water of eternal life. Give us a great hunger for the food of your true body and blood, and let all your faithful people ever be found in the apostles' doctrine, in the fellowship, in the breaking of your bread, and in the prayers. We implore you, O Lord, for our altar, that it may ever be a place where the medicine of eternal life, the forgiveness of our sins, strengthens us in body and soul, that disbelief and impenitence may stay far from all who come there, so that they may not eat and drink to their own judgment. O eternal High Priest, let the fruit of your Spirit grow in us, which is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faith, gentleness, and chastity. Cause us to live in holy conduct toward one another to the glory of your holy name, here in time and hereafter in eternity. For you live and reign with the Father in the same Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, your faithful servant Barnabas sought not his own renown, but gave generously of his life and substance for the encouragement of the apostles in their ministry. 
Grant that we may follow his example in lives given to charity and proclamation of the gospel. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Direct us, O Lord, in all our doings with your most gracious favor, and further us with continual help that in all our works, begun, continued, and ended in you, we may glorify your holy name and finally, by your mercy, obtain eternal salvation. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have graciously kept me this day. And I pray that you would forgive me all my sins where I have done wrong, and graciously keep me this night. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul, and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good night.